All right, we had left off, as I said, uh, in the midst of chapter 19, uh, and we had began talking about the marriage <coughs> supper of the Lamb and making some <coughs> comparison and contrast to the end time uh, as compared to uh, the other writings in the Bible about the marriage supper of the Lamb. And uh, we, we broke off a little early last week, and as I said, I, I gave you a homework assignment, but didn't give you the material to, to, to do what, what I had asked you to do, so now, now you've got that. Um, so I, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move on to chapter 20 tonight, okay? And 19, you've got the verses, as I said now, you've got the, the verses for the rest of that chapter. So... <clears throat> Chapter 20 gets into the great white throne judgment. It talks about a number of things. And we're just going to get started right off the bat. Chapter 20, verses 1 through, well, 1 and 2. Let's do 1 and 2 first. If someone would read those. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid that hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Okay. Good news. Satan is bound. Uh, the bottomless pit is something that's known as the abyss. Another, another word for that. It's a. Uh, it's an abyss. I'm going to ask to, to think of another adjective to describe a bit. It's a dark, dark, ugly place. Um, but Satan's going to be bound there for a thousand years. He will be released briefly again, but at least there's going to be peace on earth for a short period of time. Verse 3 says, And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, or chained him, and set upon him that he should uh, deceive nations no more till a thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed for a, a little season or for a little while. Verse four, and I saw, <clears throat> and I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and the judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. Who are these people that, that, he, that they're, they're talking about? The souls of those that were beheaded. Christ the martyrs. The martyrs. These are people that came, that have been in the tribulation period and stood, stood their ground for Christ. That would not take the mark um, and stood their ground for, for what they believed in in terms of Jesus Christ. They were beheaded. They will, it's, it's hard for me to wrap my head around this because this is stuff you hear about back in old ancient time. You know, we don't think about people being beheaded today even though they are in, in parts of the world. They still do cut people's heads off. Uh, but to realize that this is going to be just for your belief, just for your faith. I don't know why it's so difficult for me to believe when we've got shootings in schools that some people are being, being killed for their faith. For their beliefs. We watched uh, the other night, Margaret came over to the house and that when they were calling for the bad weather, she came over and, and we had uh, got a Christian network on and we watched about the Columbine shootings and uh, the little girl that uh, was the primary per person that they focused on, she was she was the first one that was killed out on, on campus and she was killed because she basically um, had faith in God. And the guy asked her up before he pulled the trigger, you know, asked her if she was ready to meet him. And she said, I am. I'm pow. You know? Um, you know, they said that was Rachel Scott. You know, they said she had journals. She knew, she saw that she wasn't going to live very long. Like she knew she wasn't going to live for a very long life. When they look back at her journals, it was really pathetic. It was really weird. Weird, yeah. Like God had 
had prepared her for that. Yeah, uh, like she knew she was not going to have a very long life. It was, it was really... So that's, that's what we're talking about here, are the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God in which they not worshiped the beast, neither his image, neither had received a mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and, had, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of, of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Um, I try to do three or four things. I can't chew gum and walk at the same time, hardly, so make sure I've got where we're at. Yeah, the first resurrection. That's for those devoted to God during the tribulation period. There'll be a second death, and we'll talk about here in just a minute. Uh, which is eternal and has no power, never will, for all those who died in Christ, they'll reign with him for a thousand years. And in verse 6, it's where it talks about that. Blessed and holy is he that had part in the first resurrection, on such the second death have no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Pastor, talk to me and tell me what it's going to be like during that time. Figuratively speaking, it's going to be pure hell. I mean, it's going to be a nightmare. Uh, the only way you're going to be able to eat, the only way you're going to be able to live, is by taking a mark. And you know, I, I hear people <coughs> often, well, you know, it's going to be these micro trip implants or some barcode. No, it's going to be a figurative number of 666. I mean, the Bible paints that, Revelation paints that picture wide. Uh, I think, and this is my opinion, it's only my opinion, this is not got nothing, you know, and, and it might if we dig deep enough, but my opinion of that whole deal is what we're going to see happen is we're going to see those who refuse to take that mark start to death, be murdered. You know, then you're going to see some that take one for the team, if you will, just so they can feed their families. Right. And in the process of doing that, they're, they're taking damnation upon themselves. I think, again, it's only my opinion, I think we're going to see a lot of pastors say, hold up a minute, I need that mark, I got kids to Knowing the end result. We're going to see a lot of <clears throat> Sunday school teachers, a lot of theologians, a lot of people, Bible scholars. You're going to see people, you know, I don't know when, again, this could start tomorrow, this evening, the week we have no clue. <coughs> We're going to set a downhill spiral. And it's already starting. If you really pay attention to everything that's going on in our country right now, and not just in our country, but the countries around us, the Muslim faith is being put above Christianity. Everything's being put above Christianity. Did you know that the evangelical Christians are on a ter terroristic watch list? So that ought to tell us something. When we see the Muslim nation starting to take over, it has become incorporated into our school systems, and we probably don't even know it. Uh, I don't know about over here in Albion County Central, but I know that Gibson County, they won't let them teach them Christianity, but they can teach them about other religions. <laughs> Makes no sense. I don't know if it's that way here or not, but... Um, there are several schools, colleges, who have become progressively more anti-Christian, and they're supposed to be Christian colleges. 
You know, it's more about philosophy and, and metaphors and all this stuff. <clears throat> and it's already happening all the way around us, everywhere we look. We don't realize it, but it's happening. Let's take, for instance, if the banks are closed and you don't have a check or cash, how do you purchase things? We all have a debit card, right? So how easy would it be for them to say, you know what, we're not printing no more currency, we're just going to go to a digitalized currency. Everybody would be like, well, that makes sense. I don't carry cash anyway. It's going to be good with me. It's happening. And I think we as a Christian nation, we ain't really dumb to it. By no means, we're not really blind to it. We just don't want to see it for what it is. Yes. It's I never get political. Never. And I refuse to. Here's why. The moment that I base my belief system off politics will be the moment I forget about Jesus. I think people ought to pray how they vote and all that don't get me wrong. But the, like you said, we're being so conditioned by government that we're supposed to trust. How can you trust somebody? It says, you know what, we're going to leave the bars open, close your churches. How do you trust that? Was it for a good reason? Yeah, more than like, I mean, I had to agree. I lost a lot from good friends that go. Don't get me wrong. But why in the world would it be okay to leave bars and liquor stores open? Because if people don't get that drink, they can withdraw from that. People who, did you know the statistics, and I'll, I'll shut up in a second, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> did you know that 96% of the people that left the church during COVID have never returned back to a church? 96%, that's a big number. It's a huge number. And nobody's better than I. I've heard a few pastors say, well, you know, I wish I was a you know, had left and come back, but I understand. Right, right. Some do have, have personal reasons why they didn't go back to a certain church, but they never went back to church nowhere because the government told them it was dangerous. We're conditioning every day and we don't realize it. I got off my soapbox, Mom. Sorry. No. <laughs> Well, as you said, it's lived literally hell on earth. Something that we can't even wrap our heads around. I mean, we, we've gone through, <clears throat> we will soon have gone through 369 slides. I think it's what, what we've done in the book of Revelation, the slides that we put up here on, on the screen. And still, <coughs> can't really wrap our heads around how bad it's going to be. It's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. Uh, that's why we're doing this study. That's why we're doing. That's why we do what we do. That's why he gets up and preaches on Sunday morning, whenever, whenever else he preaches. That's why he does podcast. Uh, trying to keep the thing active and alive and reach as many people as you can while you can. Uh, but anyhow. Something happens. Well, I'm about to jump ahead of myself. We've got to do seven through nine. Somebody read that for me. <clears throat> when the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to the sea of the nations in four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. And then for there, like the sand on the seashore, they marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Okay, so right in the middle of all this, we've got Gog and Magog. You, you remember in the Bible, being in the Old Testament, these folks being referenced? Remember the Bible talking about Gog and Magog? Okay. Uh, God was a Reubenite. 
and Magog was the second son of Japheth. And that really doesn't have a lot of significance other than the fact that it's symbolic of them being enemies. That's what it's, in, it's the symbolism here. Uh, <coughs> I'm not, I'm not questioning God, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not questioning God on this. I'm questioning my own understanding, if anything. But I've often wondered why after Satan has been bound for a thousand years, he gets loosed again. But like I said, that's my own under, lack of understanding. Yeah, I think part of it, I can't believe they were born during that time. Well, I'm sure that's one thing man's never, never stopped doing is reproducing. And that, they ain't got to have a chance, you know, to yeah. make that decision. Right. I, I that, that was it. It could be. It makes sense. Uh -huh. it um, makes about as much sense as anything I've ever heard until as an explanation, so. But anyhow, um, Satan is released, collects and deceives all that he can, uh, wages war against the saints. Uh, they approach Jerusalem for the purpose of attack and slaughter, but God destroys them all with fire from heaven. You see that in verse 9. And, and well, actually 10 as well. Verse 10 says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. How do you like them apples? About time, isn't it? Like, it makes me wonder, I mean, God is all-knowing. He knows what's going to happen. So it really makes me wonder, does he have foreknowledge of somebody in that thousand years that's going to, that would rise up and attempt to be like Satan did in heaven? You know, so like, okay, I know that that's how you're going to be, so I'll let you choose, and if that is how you want to do, then there you go. That's just a possibility in my brain, I don't know. No. Um, I thought the same way. I don't know either. I thought along the same lines, but I don't know. It's not really clearly defined. Any more in the Bible that I know of. You know, we have scripture that further explains. I can't talk about it. I, I, I really can't. I don't. Know. And that's actually what I was sitting here doing. I was looking at the margin, trying to see if there's any breakdowns. I'm not saying I'm doing Well, this is the this is white room judgment for Satan. Essentially, Satan is cast into the lake of fire forever. Speaking of brick white thrones, we're going to look at uh, we're going to look at verses eleven. Verse 11 is great white throne. Final judgment of all souls. Um, God with his face of, of pure, unadulterated, righteous judgment, which even the earth and the heavens try to hide from because they cannot look upon him, um, is going to judge. This will be a sign of God that we, the world has never seen before. So let me read verse 11 right quickly. Yeah, quick. Oh. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. Okay. All right. As I said, a great 
about their own final judgment of all souls. Verses 12 through 15. Uh, first books. If somebody will pick up and read those, we'll finish out. We're actually going to finish out this chapter a little early. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Don't get much plainer than that. That's the reason we're, <coughs> excuse me, that's the reason that, that we are finishing this chapter a little early. I think this, this chapter is pretty self-explanatory. There's not much argument with the points, but it doesn't matter. I, I may have been a bad person at one point in my life. Made a lot of bad decisions. And it really doesn't matter in the overall scheme of things if, if I had an awakening one day and I changed my mind and decided to be a better person. That's not going to get me into heaven. Just being a better person than what I was. It doesn't matter if I, if I dropped everything that I used to do and made a total turnaround in my life. It doesn't matter if, if, I'm, uh, if I'm out here and, and, and doing everything I can to help humanity. No matter how, I, I can't be good enough to get into heaven. My name has got to be in the Lamb's Book of Life. And there's only one way to do that. What is it? Accepting Jesus as your Savior. That's it. That's it. So the, the Bible here, John pretty just cuts to the chase and says, uh, So another book was opened, which is the Book of Life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead. This is another thing. Picture this one. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. This is not the only time in the Bible when, when dead people, uh, when, when dead people's bones were reassembled. Not the first time. A miracle like this took place, but th but this is going to happen. Uh, just it's so far out there; it's hard to it's hard to fathom how this could happen. And the reason it's so far out there is because it takes the, the knowledge of God to be able to accept the things that we don't understand, which is called faith. But. The bones of those that have been decayed for years and years are all of a sudden going to come back together. Flesh is going to be put back on those bones. People that people that have that have been uh, uh, cremated, there's nothing but ashes there, but the body's going to be reformed. It's hard to it's hard to understand how that how that can happen, but the Bible says that this is what's going to take place. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. And they were judged every man according to the worst. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Okay, death and hell. This is not the first time we've, we've looked at these two, uh, these two terms. Death is, remember this, death is a body without a soul and hell is a soul without a body. Remember that? We were talking about that way back when we first started Revelation. Well, here we are, getting close to the end, and it's we're, we're recapping. Some of the stuff's coming back around again. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. <coughs> and it doesn't get any more self explanatory than that, does it? I want us to. Uh, 
tonight, I, I, I really feel it's impressed upon me. It has weighed on me the whole time I've been up here doing this. If I seem a little distracted, it's because my mind is somewhere else tonight. But I'm really concerned about the state of our nation, and I'm really concerned about the state of our county, and I'm really concerned about schools across the United States. And maybe I'm maybe I'm being a little prejudiced, but I'm concerned about our local school system. Um, and so I. I want us to have a special word of prayer, if we could tonight, with everybody focusing on that one issue. Instead of mind wandering and, and or praying for multiple things, I want us to just take, take a few minutes and, and kind of uh, say a prayer for our surrounding uh, school systems. Um, I understand that if there's another Walk out plan for tomorrow. That's what they were reporting on the news before we left home, Channel 6. So, um, now I'm not even going to comment on those things. That's, <coughs> that's neither here nor there. But, but um, anyway, I'm going to hush. Brother Tom, would you, would you mind reading us in a in a special word of prayer for our school system, our children, and the parents that are having to undergo a lot of scrutiny and, and, and so forth right now. Oh, well. Father, Father, we come to you tonight, Lord, we just say we need you. We need you now more than ever. Father God, there's such a disarray of people that is walking among us, Lord, every day that we have almost closed our eyes to, Father God. Lord, we know that our war is not against flesh and blood. Lord, we know that this is a spiritual war. Father God, not we fight it the only way we know how, and that's through prayer. Father, I ask that you put a hedge of protection around each and every kid, not only here, Father God, but all across this nation, Father God. Teachers, parents that are struggling, Father God, with, with every issue that, that is faced right now, Father God, that you will just wrap them up in your arms, Father God. Lord, that Justice will be swift and it will be certain. Father God, those that are accountable will be held accountable. Lord, but these kids are innocent. Lord, you said if we if we hindered them from coming to you, well, Father God, we're better off just tie a milestone around our neck and throw ourselves in the lake. Father God, this, this evening, Father God, I ask that you give us the courage and the boldness, Lord, to be representation of you for these kids. No matter what society says, no matter how it may look to people that don't know, Father God, but our life lived for you bring people to you. Father God, I ask not only for boldness, Father God, but Lord, just courage, Lord, that these teachers have every day as they go to school, Father God. Lord, knowing that in the back of their mind there are all pins and needles, Father God, but we know that you will supply all of their needs. Father God, I ask that you would be with the parents of, of everything that these kids are battling right now. Father God, I know the parents are hurting. Father God, because it's their babies. Lord, I ask that you will do what only you can do, Lord, and give them comfort tonight. Give them a not just a sense of peace, Father God, but peace. Lord, that, that says, you know what? Lord, you're in control. We're not. Father God, I pray for this nation, Lord. It is upside down. Lord, from one end to the other, it is just backwards. Lord, we have 
we as Christians have prayed and prayed and prayed and, and asked for change, Father God, and we just simply stood back and stood to the side while you were slowly taken out of things. Lord, I ask that we'll find the courage and the boldness to make sure that you're put back into the things that we stood by and let you be taken out of. Father God, let us start back in our school systems. Let us start back in our homes, first and foremost. Father God, let it come back to a nation that is crippled. Lord, because we're wounded, we're hurting. Lord, we've been this way for many, many years. Nobody's just ever said anything. Father God, but you are God. You're our Father. Lord, tonight I ask you to do what only you can do, Lord. And send a fire of revival that will sweep across this nation. Lord, not just not just in song, but in salvation, that the gospel will be preached, that people will come to you humble and broken to give their life to you. Lord, I think I speak for many of us here tonight. Lord, when I say, send me, I'll go. Lord, whatever it takes to win the loss to you, Lord, we're willing to do that tonight. Tomorrow, the next day, and so forth and so on. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We give you all honor and glory. In the sweet name of Jesus, we pray. The church said, Amen. Amen. Amen.